Sorry, Dima, I hope I didn't break it. It's okay now. It's fine. Yes, it's fine. Yeah. Is it working, Dima? You can hear okay. Okay, hello, everybody. I saw some of you a few days ago, but not everyone. This time, I'm not going to talk about science. I'm going to talk about talking about science. Okay, so there's a difference. And uh, I would like to acknowledge my co-author, uh, Olga Morozova, <laughs> who helped me to put this together. And I have to warn you that um, I will provide a lot of information that might seem like an ego trip but it's not. It's tried to, to, for you to understand how I'm communicating, who I'm communicating to. So please don't think this is me building a very big ego. Um, but there is Olga and I, and she's talking to uh, Sir David Attenborough. For those, do you all know Sir David Attenborough's work? So he communicates. He's talking to 1.4 billion people. And that is communication. I don't know who can communicate better than that. So what is the mission of the talk? The mission is to present some experiences, to give examples of some challenges in, in communicating, and also to give some tips of how to communicate. And then to give some examples of different ways of communicating. Because at the moment I'm just talking at you and I'm showing slides. But there are many different ways of communicating. And then. At the end, I want to try to generate some discussion, and there are questions throughout the presentation, so spot the questions, and then at the end, I'll repeat the questions, and maybe you, you have more and different questions, but if not, we can discuss these questions. So we have a plan. Okay, so just a little bit about me. I started off, that's me in 1967 on South Georgia in the subantarctic with elephant seals. So I started off going as far away from people as I could possibly go. So I was communicating with seals <laughs> and not people. And you can see I, I didn't do a good job. The seals are very angry. Um, but from going as far away as possible for, from people, I think there were 20 people on that island. The next island is about 2,000 miles away. So this is a very small community. But after com communicating at that level, then I was communicating with these guys. This is the King of Sweden. This is the, the Crown Princess of Sweden, who will be the next Queen when he dies. And this is the Crown Prince of Denmark, who will be the King of Denmark when his mother dies. So I went from communicating with seals to communicating with kings and future queens. And the king is holding a book called the Arctic Climate Impact Assessment Popular Summary. It was published in 2004. And it communicated. So the king read it. And not only did the king read it, he then presented the ideas to his parliament. Because like in Britain, the, the royal family opened the parliament session every year. So his opening speech to the Swedish parliament was about climate change in the Arctic. So question one is, how do we communicate with a king and future queen? My example here, but you should have your own, is just to produce a beautiful uh, document that they want to look at. They may not want to read it. For Sorry? For seals and kings. Oh, what? Document for seals and kings. Yes. <laughs> I, I need to learn how to influence the, the seals. I, I'm working on that. <laughs> so then... What I was in, in the Antarctic, I was in the Arctic, well away from people, but then somehow, somehow I had to come out of the cold into uh, the public arena. It wasn't part of my 
plan. And in fact, the, it broke my um, career development because uh, I was cheated. I didn't know when I started on South Georgia talking to the SEALs that one day I'd have to wear a tie and a suit and uh, that wasn't part of my um, plan. So I was coming out of the cold, but as my dear co-author said, that might be misinterpreted. So question two is, does the graphic match the messages? Which messages should be prioritized? Bringing people together or coming out of the cold? Does the slide work? So you can think about that. And by the way, just for your um, information, that is from a nickel, not nickel, help me. It's in the polar Urals, yes, but what is the mine? It's chromium, chromium mine in the polar Urals. One of the things that we're doing pretty well in terms of communicating is that I, I founded a network of research stations called Interact. Interact has 86 research stations now, a whole bunch here in Russia, and uh, Sergey is managing quite a lot of them, from Actru all the way up to uh, Kaibasovo and even further north now. What we do is we have money from Europe, and uh, we also have some money from the US and from Canada, to send scientists into the field. There's one limitation. They can't go to a research station in their own country. So what we're doing is we're building collaborations between scientists from different countries, and we're starting new communications. And just to show you, there are 86 research stations, 18 countries, and each of these line tracks the movement where there's a, a flag that's the destination uh, where there's a dot that's where the people originate from so uh, you can see people here going from Italy up to uh, the Arctic uh, people from um, Europe going way over to the Far East uh, and so on and the thickness of the line denotes the number of groups so the thick lines are many groups going in, in one direction or the other. But that has started up a big international communication. As you see here, about 900 researchers have uh, been put into the field, uh, financed by Interact. And those guys are talking together now. So if you want to know what they're doing, you, they, they have blogs and they uh, Facebook sites and so on. Right, so now examples of some challenges and some tips. The main challenge, and I hope your English is good enough for this, so tomorrow you have to help with the English and the translation. So the main challenge for us scientists to communicate to decision makers is we are science nerds. I hope you understand what the word nerd means. And we are science nerds trying to communicate complex issues to politicians that have selective hearing. Okay, so these are two things far, far apart. And somehow we have to break down these barriers and get them together. And we have to talk in a good way. We don't have to be nerdish. We have to get out of that and talk to politicians about something they can understand in a way they can understand. And we have to interest them. And then associated with being a nerd, being a science nerd, we all want, when we write and talk, we all want to sound authoritative. We all want to sound that, uh, and impress people that we know our subject. And we do that by using big words and complicated words, and that's what makes us nerds. So remember, any idiot can make a simple issue appear to be really complicated, but it takes a clever and humble person to make a very complicated issue seem simple. That's where the thought comes. It takes a lot of imagination. And then two words, are and I'm looking now at the journalist. See, there are two words in English and communication that are extremely difficult to get across to the general public. And these words are variability and uncertainty. And these are things that every scientist works with, or every environmental scientist works with all the time. And we have particular measures. We have measures of uncertainty. We have statistics, statistical analyses, and variability. We plot time series and look at, we can analyze the variability in our time series. So we are used to those t terms. We are used to the, those two aspects of our measurements. The public are not. So what happens? This is my Land Rover, Dima. You like my Land Rover? 
This, this is a cold winter, and this was in my home on March in 2016. You see the snow. One cold winter, a few cold days in winter when you don't expect them, reverses the public opinion about climate warming. So if you showed them the graph, the long-term graph, and showed that it isn't just a smooth trend of climate going, getting warmer and warmer, it goes up and down, up and down, up and down, but the overall trend is upwards over a long time period, then people would understand. But when they hit with this type of variability, they're lost, and they don't believe us. They don't believe in climate warming. Then there's another topic that I want to talk about, a very different topic, and this is about pessimism. And I think some of you have heard this story before when I last talked, so please forgive me if I tell it again, but it's from a different perspective this time. This is where I worked in Arbisco, in Swedish Lapland, and I was there for 12 years. Every two weeks I was there, every other two weeks I was in my home in England. This is what it looked like in winter. There's a road there somewhere, um, so it's a difficult place to be. <coughs> difficult climate, difficult weather. When I was talking to um, schools, one of um, the people I talked to uh, I told the story that one, one, the hardest question I've ever been asked by any scientist, any member of the public, any politician, was by a six-year-old child. And that six-year-old child asked me, what is the most difficult thing you ever had to do in your life and your career? And of course, the, the child didn't know the question he was asking me. He was thinking about polar bears, helicopters, boats, icebergs, all the fun stuff, crevasses and glaciers. But the, I had to think, but the hardest thing was for me to go to a school like his and tell all the kids about the bad news, the pessimism of climate change without telling what the answers were and how they would survive in the future. Because I don't know how they will survive in the future. So that is a terrible responsibility that we have when we talk about climate change. We can't leave a school with school kids and tell them you're going to live in a disastrous world. Um, we can't do that. And then I told this story in Germany and there was a, an industrialist from the Ruhr Valley in Germany. And he said, don't worry Terry, he said, do you have grandchildren? I said, yeah, I have four. And he said, and this is one and this is Kira. And he said, what happens if you want to take them out for a picnic and you promise them to take them out in a picnic and it rains and, or snows. And I said, no problem, we've put on outdoor clothing. And uh, then they have fun and they can still go out, they can still enjoy it because they are adapted to the weather on that particular day. So it's the same for climate. If we say climate for weather, then the young kids, they will have a different climate than we have today. But if they're adapted for it, then they will cope with it and they will enjoy it. It will be a nice world so long as they're adapted for it, as long as they put their outdoor clothes on, or the equivalent of that adaptation. Um, so this is a, the comment for you that about pessimism. We can't leave the world pessimistic. We have to give hope, and particularly to young children. So my third question, what other ways can we reduce pessimism but be realistic about the future. It's not easy. Have you got any other ideas? Then there's two other things um, about communicating. One is political correctness. I'm not going to say too much about that because I'm highly politically incorrect. Um, in Russia, I can be open. <laughs> we don't have freedom of speech in England, so I can't be in England, uh, which is a big problem these days. Um, but I, I do want to say rather more about the shock tactics in communication. And we have to remember that our audiences have different cultures, different genders, different generations, and they respond differently. So my generation uses words that are now inappropriate to uh, the modern generation. They're politically incorrect. And I don't, it's very difficult for people of my age to understand that, because when we use the words, we don't intend to offend anyone. OK? Um, but now people are very uh, perceptive of any offensive language. So we can be, our career, whole careers can be destroyed if we use a lang uh, the language that we used when we were children. And we don't mean any offense, it's just that's the way we grew up. 
Okay, so let's look at this. This is in some of my talks and it's intended to shock. Right, so the statistics are sea level rise in the next 50 years is likely to affect over 140 million people and desertification even more. And now we ca in Europe we can't handle tens of thousands of migrants. How will we cope with tens of millions of climate migrants? At the moment the migrants are not climate migrants, they're economic migrants or migrants from war zones. In the future there will be tens of millions of migrants um, which are climate change migrants. So here you see terrible statistics about the number of, of, uh, of migrants. This is Germany, 30,000 migrants taken in. Uh, United States, 13,500 taken in. And you see barbed wire holding the, uh, the, the population in. So this is shock tactics. And, th and this is deliberately used uh, to an audience to get their attention. Okay, so it's all, not all a nice story. It's not all nice flowers and uh, furry animals. It's hard, realistic facts. And of course, what really frightens a lot of people is they may live in a country which is not going to suffer from climate change directly. But if it's not, where are the tens of millions of migrants going to go? They're going to go to that country. So every country will be involved in some way or other, either directly or indirectly. So this makes people think, but does it, is it too pessimistic? Does it make them think too much? So that was one example, and this is another one. Um, and you may violently disagree with this, but we'll try it anyway. This is a map of the Arctic. The, 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 the circles are just big cities, it's just background, so there's no real story there. It's about the number of people that live in those Arctic countries and the percentage of indigenous people. But don't dwell on that, dwell on this. That the worst consequence of climate change, in my personal view, is not about glaciers, animals, plants and snow it's, and carbon. It's about geoconflicts. Geoconflicts for resources. So here we're looking at the first one. This is a little bit out of date, so forgive me. But Canada has just built the largest research station in the whole of the Arctic. It's called CHARS, Canadian High Arctic Research Station. Now 20 years ago when it was being planned, the, people, the government officials who were responsible for this came to talk to me as the, the, the boss of the Arbisco station, which then was the biggest, and a few other stations. And they wanted their advice on to how to run the station. And my question to them was, what are you going to do at the station? And they said, we don't know. Right? So you are putting a few billion um, dollars into putting up a village and research station in the high Arctic where it's very difficult to work, but you don't know what it's going to do. But what they did know is exactly where it was going to be. And it was going to be on the Northwest Passage. Why? Because the ice conditions are changing so you can get ships from the Pacific to the Atlantic through the Northwest Parish Passage. Now the US has not ratified the Treaty of the Sea. So the US is saying that these waters, the Northwest Passage, are international waters of free access to the US. The Canadians are saying no way. These are Canadian territorial waters. So the Canadians, to block the Americans, have built this village to put their stamp. This is ours. So that's one sign of conflict, US-Canada. Russia. In 1994, I had the wonderful, wonderful opportunity of sailing all along the Russian coastline in uh, the academic Fedorov icebreaker on a Swedish-Russian expedition. I started on uh, Katanga in the Taimir and went all the way to Pervek and Wrangel Island and back again. We went to the Novosibirsk Zemlya, yeah, New Siberian Islands, and they were amazing, just fantastic place. I can't go back because now it's a military base. It's a Russian military base closed uh, to the public. Then, here, Iceland. Iceland was a major base during, Dima's listening now, during the Second World War because this was extremely important to be able to protect the convoys from the US that sailed off Iceland to, to bring supplies to the UK. So this was an extremely important post. There was an air base as well. But then after the war, the, the, the Americans gave the Keflavik airport to Iceland and they withdrew. Now they're putting their military back because the Arctic is becoming a very big geopolitical arena. And then what happens next? 
se several people, uh, several countries are claiming the North Pole, and that's all because a friend of ours, Frederick Paulson, paid for someone to put a, a Russian flag under the North Pole. It was a joke, but that joke uh, <laughs> created huge diplomatic. Recently, he was awarded by Putin. Sorry. Recently, he was awarded by Putin. Yes. At the special meeting of uh, Russian Geographical Society. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, he told about his stories yeah, yeah. by Russian TV. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it, it, yeah, but it created a lot of problems. And this is just a funny thing now, that um, there is a place called Hans Rock, which is a little rock here, and it's not much bigger than this room. Uh, and there's nothing on it, it just comes straight out of the sea. And there's a fight between Canada and Greenland about who owns that rock. And the reason for that is because of the territory that goes around, the seabed that goes around it. So if there's oil there, it's a very important rock. But the fun thing is that if the Canadians visit it, they leave a bottle of whiskey for the Greenlanders. And if the Greenlanders visit it, they leave a bottle of schnapps for the, for the, uh, the Canadians. And that is excellent conflict resolution. <laughs> so question four. How can we discuss possible conflict while being impartial? Should we be impartial? So maybe, I don't know, did I offend someone here by talking about the Russians closing down uh, the, the new Siberian islands? I don't know if I did or not, but I can imagine that in some audiences there would be some very patriotic person who would be quite angry about what, what I've said here. But in my view, this is about geopolitical problems that could arise and get worse if people start fighting for resources. So the question, yeah, so there is another question there for you. And then there is some, I talked about shock tactics and now uh, political correctness. The next one is something that I find very strange, and I think journalists have to be really very careful about this. And this is reverse psychology. And I didn't know anything about this until the, the, the start of climate change and the very first IPCC in 1990. And what happened was we were producing a report. And I don't know if you know the IPCC methodology, but it is very, very strict that we write, and it takes a couple of years to write, and then it goes to the heads of all the governments involved, and their government scientists look at it. Then it goes out to open review, and we don't only have to listen to what the review comments are, we have to produce tables that are hundreds of pages long. Every comment is detailed by every reviewer, and there are sometimes maybe 50 reviewers for one paper. And then we have to say how we responded to those comments. But it's all in secret until the day that the, the report is released. But someone had released some information, and that information was that sea level will rise, and it could be a problem. Then what happened is the, the media uh, approached IPCC, and IPCC said, no, we're not giving you any information until the report is published. So they went to one guy in Durham University with a laptop who had his own model of uh, sea level rise, and they asked him, and this is what he said, this is what will happen to Britain with sea level rise. And there you see very little of Britain left. Okay, what he didn't say was that was if all the ice in the world melted and you get an 80 metre increase in sea level, so people, this hit the, the, the press, TV, radio, newspapers in Britain immediately. And there was panic in Britain. You imagine the people that live in, in these areas. They were terrified. For me, I'm OK. I'm here in the hills. So I'm OK, and I'd be very happy to see Manchester disappear. But, <laughs> but a lot of people, there are a few million people living in Manchester, so they're not happy. So this created panic. And then the IPCC was absolutely forced to go out and give them what they thought would happen. And this is two metres, and even that is an overestimate of what we think will happen in, um, in the next 50 years. And the, the, the orange areas are the areas we will lo lose. But what happened was the whole of the public th said, thank goodness it's only two metres, no problem. And of course it's the absolute opposite. There is a huge problem. But because the, the public thought it's not going to be as bad as that, it's on the left, then they were happy, really happy. So climate change was not an issue for them. 
and it's killed by this reverse psychology. So, the, the next question is, should we shock people to gain their attention? And then the next one that I, I also struggle with, and I really struggled in my last talk to schools, and this is the sensitive presentation of an indigenous people's lives and their perspectives. So I'm always very careful when I talk to school kids, um, but I also have to be realistic. And on the last occasion and other occasions, I show them pictures like this. First of all, this one. I've, I've been kind to you. I've chosen a black and white picture. This is one I took in 1967 uh, in Greenland, West Greenland. And we just had what's called a saset. And a saset is a pollinia in the ice where a lot of whales come together to breathe. And then as soon as those whales gather, then the local Greenlandic hunters go out and kill them. <laughs> and then they bring them back on these ships and then they split them up and they cut them up. And they, the, the, the greatest delicacy is the, the, uh, the blubber and the skin of the whale, and that's called matak. And then they put them in these piles. The little kids eat it while it's still steaming and wet and full of blood. And they, they, it's a very communistic society, so they share very equally. So they all have equal piles of the, the skin and the blubber of the whales. Now, I've been kind to you guys because I've shown a black and white photo, but I don't show that at a school. But then I do show this one, but I have to be careful. This is a hunter's house at Karnak, in, that's about as far north as any people naturally live in Greenland, in West Greenland. And that is a typical hunter's house. But if you, I haven't got a laser point or anything to point with, but if you look carefully, you can see polar bear skin there, you can see another polar bear skin there, there's a brown skin there, which is a muskox skin, and there will be seal skins there. Now, I have to make the point that these people live there all year round. They have to depend on those animals for food, for skins, for their clothing, for their, their beds, the blankets on their beds, for carpets on the floor. Uh, to, they wouldn't survive if they didn't kill these people. They can't just go to a supermarket and buy something. So I have to say that. And then at the last school, the teacher, <coughs> we've just sent a hundred pounds to World Wildlife Fund to adopt a polar bear, <laughs> right? So how do you tackle that? That these poor kids, they now think that they sent a hundred pound to adopt a polar bear that's just been killed by these Eskimos to eat it. <laughs> so. It's a very sensitive issue, and I don't know the answers, uh, but I'm just telling you what the issues are. So question five is how, is that, how would you communicate hunting iconic species to the public and schools, etc., cetera, um, outside the Arctic? And then the next one is how do you think an indigenous Arctic person would communicate their hunting activities to people outside the Arctic? The reason for that is because an indigenous person would not have any sensitivity whatsoever. That's his life, her life. Why should they be careful about saying, it's like you saying, I go to the supermarket and buy a sausage. For them, it's the same. I go out and I shoot a polar bear and I've got a meal and I've got some clothes. So for them, it's no problem. Um, so these are two questions you might want to think about. And then, uh, this is a tip now, something completely different, but it's a tip. And that is that w w we as scientists are very concerned with presenting graphs and histograms and very complex diagrams. And again, part of it is not just because of the complexity, it's because we want to seem to other people to be clever people. So we make it difficult. But in fact, you don't need statistics to understand that it's bad news to go from 1941 to 2014 and lose our glaciers. It doesn't need a huge amount of mathematics and graphs and histograms to get that package over. And my next example is an, a real hidden gem, and that's to go from here, 1906, in Lapland, to here, 1986. Why is this a hidden gem? It's because we only started looking at vegetation change from space with satellites in the 1980s. Okay? Most of our monitoring of climate change has only been from the 1980s as well, because that's when we became aware of climate change. Before that, we had a cooling period, and you have to go back to the 1930s before it was warm again. So 
most of our knowledge, no, I would say 99% of our knowledge, comes from the last 30 years. Now, what you see in this photo is something that, that the vegetation has changed dramatically, hasn't it? We all agree? But when you look very closely at this photo, what do you see? You see a Sami Kota. That's like the Nenets tomb. It's the tenth where they lived. You see racks for drying uh, fish and drying uh, skins and animal meat. And all the energy they used was from the, the wood. So they were using the forest intensively, taking down a lot of trees. Now they don't. Since the Second World War, they moved into concrete block houses. And they don't use wooden utensils. They have metal things. So, and they don't burn wood on the fire all the time. They have uh, oil and gas. So what has happened between here and here are two things. Climate warming, climate change, which is what we'd expect, but also changing the way people live and use the environment. And the reason why th these pictures are so important is because we wouldn't know that if we just looked at the satellite images. So the pictures are extremely important, and there is a lot of hidden information in them that need to be brought out. Now then, another topic completely, and perhaps the most challenging of all, is different ways of communicating. There are so many different ways of communicating. And I've just, um, gi will give you a couple of examples. I I'm honored to be the patron of a charity in Britain which provides educational resources for school children. And it's called Wicked Weather Watch. And they do all sorts of things. But this is just one way of communicating with young children. This is two sides of one sheet of paper. It's just one sheet of paper. And it's an experiment. It's trying to teach children how you can understand what happened in the past in a very, very simple way. So we tell them what they do. The scientists, and I think these are your group, Sergey, and this as well, <laughs> go out into the fields. Uh, can you make? Yeah, yeah. OK. And they go, but it's your group. Yeah. yeah. And they go out into the, uh, into the wilderness and they take cores down through the peat or through sediments or through ice and they come up with a long core and then they can see different bands in this core, they can date it and they can find out what's happening here. So how do the kids do it themselves? Well, it's really high tech. They need the inside of a toilet roll and they need a wooden kitchen spoon and then the teacher gets little bits of clay, plasticine, I don't know what you call it, modelling clay. Yeah, little discs. And then in between, hides different things. So here, for example, let's... Uh, here is um, a, a conifer um, twig that will fit in the toilet roll. And here's a twig um, of a deciduous tree, oak or something like that. So it could be an acorn. And then here is, is a match. And above that is a, a dung beetle. So then the teacher takes all this apart and asks the kids, what does that mean? Well, it means there's a forest there. Oh, we start off here, what, what does that mean? There was a pond there. There's a lake there. Okay. What does this mean? Well, it dried out, there's a forest there. What does that mean? Well, the forest got warmer because it's an oak tree. And what does this mean? Oh, there's a forest fire. Or there were people there burning the wood. So, and the last one is, this is a dung beetle, so there are animals there. So this is very, very simple things that you can pick up around everywhere, but it's intended to stretch the kids and to communicate with the kids. Because if you, you tell them about carbon-14 along here and de diatoms, desmids, and all the other jawbones of chironomids, you lose them. But some fun things in the plasticine, and they're hooked. Another example that is uh, thanks to uh, TSU is that there's a mass online outreach course that I produced on the changing Arctic, and that was with support, it was paid for completely by TSU. And there are two, two versions. One is in English, and there's one in Russian. I don't have the statistics for the English, but there are four, nearly 5,000 learners. Um, there are 3,000 people actively going in and taking material out. And there are nearly 400 people who completed the course because you get university credits acknowledged by the University of the Arctic and international universities for completing the course. So that's just one example of how you give outreach to a lot of people. And then you can add to that the thousands of uh, Russian language speakers that are also attending that. So that's another way of, um, of approaching the subject. And now this one. 
I, I like because this is how you hook people like ambassadors with even boring books. And this is one of our examples. This is an interact book. But this is management planning. I think you've read it, haven't you, Tanya? But it, incredibly boring. This is about how, we, what the legal responsibilities of a station manager are, what the safety regulations are, uh, all these sorts of things. But the secret is to make them look beautiful. And when they look beautiful, then people will open the pages and maybe read a bit. And then, continuing with the attractiveness, we, we, we're exploring the use of art and act attractiveness to, to play games. And this is a very simple memory game, but we're, we're focusing on pattern. OK, so this is not high science, this is just pattern. And we will have a stack of playing cards, and each of those playing cards will have a pattern on. And it will be face down, and then there will be lots of them, different topics, and then face down is an explanation of what that pattern is. What you have to do is you pick up a card, then you'll see a pattern, or you'll see an explanation, then you have to pick up another one and match it. But then there will be a lot of them, so you have to remember where all these things are. But as soon as you, you know what it is, then there will be an explanation of what it is. So I think everyone will know that. Yeah? Does anyone does not know it? Does anyone not know what it is? No? Sorry? No? No, no. But that, that, don't be embarrassed. That's absolutely perfect. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to confuse people. These are tundra polygons with sunken centers. So that, that's fantastic because you showed that this is a valuable exercise. Because we're trying to do exactly what we did then. We're trying to confuse people. This one, this beautiful pattern. Do you know what that is? Anyone want to guess? Sand. Sorry? Sand in the desert. It's sea ice. sea ice. It's breaking sea ice in front of a glacier. So, but, but no, it's fantastic. Because uh, if everyone knew what it was, then I'd be wasting my time, wouldn't I? So we're trying to fool people. We're trying. And by fooling people, they learn. So you will now know that that's thunder polygons and that's sea ice. That's perfect. That's what we're trying to do. And then the, the other thing we did, which we, we think is, is, is very novel, when you were children, did you ever play trump cards? Yeah? No? Yes? When you had cards, and my kids, they had cards. One was a football card, and you know, how many goals did this guy score, and uh, how fast could he run, and, and so on. And then you would compete with each other, and it, if I had the card, and, and I had a, a footballer who'd scored a thousand goals, I'd say, I'm going for how many go goals you scored. And if someone had a, a card for another footballer who scored more, then he'd win that card. If not, I would win the card, right? So it's a competition. So we've made them for research stations. So these, this is two sides of a card, playing card. So here is op opening year, so the, the challenge there is how old is the station? How long has it been running? Here, how far north it is? Um, here, how high is it? And uh, how remote is it, the distance to the settlement? W how cold is it? Uh, how much uh, precipitation does it get? How many visitors does it get every year? And the area of it? And how many disciplines are studied? And you can have, a, and we do, we have games where people sit around the room and they compete with each other with 84 research stations trying to guess and, uh, and, and have fun. Then the one that I think I'm most proud of is something that I see as a development for TSU. And I said this, I think, about eight years ago to the, the vice chancellor, the rector, that. TSU is clever with um, art, is clever with, um, with computer IT, and it could have a market for producing animations. So we started, and we now have four animations. And these animations um, are of environmental processes, and this is how it starts. You get me, who's pretending to be an artist, who tries to draw a process like something would look in the last ice age, something that like it looks now, or something that looks like that in the high Arctic that could look like that in a few hundred years, OK? And then, just to get better detail than I can draw, we get the experts to give us photographs 
and here another photograph to match this trend and then we put it all together into an, an animation and in, I won't show you the whole animation we haven't got time but in five minutes you can see a process that takes normally 10,000 years and that's the power of the animation you can't go out and see that you can't video it because you have to stay, stay there for 10,000 years but not only is it capturing what has happened for 10,000 years it also shows you what hap could happen in the high arctic in the next few hundred years because of climate warming that's one we've just completed one we did a while ago was this one uh, and this was the one I think that um, actually showed what's possible and I'm just going to show you I think half a minute of this and, I, and then it, you will experience something that's taken a long time okay there is a voiceover but you may not be able to hear it but this is showing going into a warm period so we're now going into a warm period we're now splitting the glacier into half on the left half you have a stable climate okay but on the right half you have climate change so you have the glacier shrinking, the volume going down, the water running off, you have water going down the moulins, and you end up with being able to see the moraines that were formed. So all this is a model, but a moving model. So there's no way you can see that dynamic process by going out into the field. But this is, I think, extremely powerful. I'm personally putting a lot of effort into this. Um, we need a lot, of, a lot of help and also we have really good people here at TSU this was built at TSU and the, the one I showed you before is now available from TSU completed and we have two on permafrost as well okay the next one is about how to produce a book on science and the indigenous peoples when they tell their kids and their grandkids about what it used to be like they don't show them graphs and histograms they tell stories and the kids remember the stories and pass it down to their kids so we we stole the uh, the method from the indigenous people and we put together um, a book called stories of arctic science so it's not your normal book with long chapters complicated language it's very simple each story is beautifully illustrated and it's just two pages what did we do why did we do it? What did we find? Why is it important? And the last part is what was the adventure so we can catch the young generation, get them interested in the adventure. So the next question is, what other ways of communicating can you imagine? And what other interactions with the art world can you envisage? So we need novelty, we need new ideas, we need to engage people in different ways and many ways all the time. Now I'm sorry about this, this might sound to be my ego, but this is just the difficulty in my personal life of communicating, that sometimes I have to communicate at this level. So this one is talking to one of the first Arctic Circle meetings, um, to Prime Ministers and Presidents and Ministers. This is a Member of Parliament, <laughs> Olga recognising, this is a British Ambassador to Iceland, and this was a very high level meeting, I think 2,000 people. Um, this was in Moscow, a Moscow State University, and there were Russian ministers there. This was also in Moscow. This is Sergei Donskoy, is that right? Minister of Environment. Uh, former. Former, okay. And Arturo Klingarov. Do you know who is the president? No. Uh, former governor of Yamalani's uh, autonomous district. Okay, okay. So, th so that's one level of, of communicating to th those people to make them engaged and to make them uh, understand the issues. And then this is another one. So schools, and this is very strange, but this is a school of Muslim, uh, mainly Muslim girls, and then old people. So, so here you've got the full range. I'm talking to you as scientists today, but then tomorrow I might be talking to uh, Islamic girls who are about 10 years old and then the next week I might be talking to old men in the 90, 80s and 90s so for that range of communication you have to have some common themes and you have to have some uh, new, different methods to engage them and then I'm sorry about this again it's, it's not just about ego but this is the the result of that so um, this communication 
and working with people from different countries is not just about better science or communicating with the public. It's much more important than that. It's actually called science diplomacy and it's about building bonds between b people in different countries because our governments are fighting together very often. I mean, it's not the people that are fighting together, it's the governments that are fighting together. And if we can have bottom-up processes um, that get over uh, that top uh, level uh, problem, then we will make the world a better place. So these are just examples of uh, medals given um, by the International Science Committee, uh, the King of Sweden, the Queen of England, and Tom State University. Um, and uh, this, these awards are all shared with Interact and SecNet. They wouldn't have happened without Interact and SecNet. And I don't know because of SecNet and the Megatransect, Sergey picked up a beautiful award as well. I think I'm getting towards the end of my talk now, but we need science communicators. We really do. Why? This is my example. We all know about the floods in Florida and around the world, the landslides. But look at this. I was involved in the very first IPCC and several more after that. The ICC told us in 1990, and then the Arctic Climate Impact Assessment repeated in 2005, change, there will be changes in the amount of precipitation, significantly altered hydrological regime. That means flooding, uh, high levels of, radi of, of rainfall, sea level rise increased variability, that's the extreme events. We foresaw all that and we warned all the governments of the world about that in 1990 and nobody listened. So now we have the young generation who's fed up, <laughs> tired, depressed with us old guys and want to do it themselves. So now you have Greta Thunberg and you have uh, kids at school going on strike. I don't think it happens in Russia yet but it happens in, um, in, 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 in Europe and Scandinavia. And they have a movement now, and this young lady, she's 16 years old, but she's addressed international conferences of uh, government. Um, and uh, she was at the British government, speaking at the British government just a few weeks ago. So no one listened to us old guys, so maybe our communication skills weren't good. So we need new communicators and we need new communication skills. That's it. Oh, no, it isn't, because these are summary issues. But I will just flag these up. I've given you all the information now, so it's up to you to ask me questions and to make, perhaps even think about these questions. And everybody is quiet. And don't be shy. <laughs> I, was, uh, I was touched by the question, should we refresh or when we speak about, when we discuss the possible, um, when we discuss the, the possible uh, outcomes uh, of the, um, the pollution and the problems, uh, the geopolitical conflicts that could arise. And but my question is, can we be partial? Can we about that? <laughs> yeah. Not only should we, but can we? Are we able to be impartial speaking about these issues? Yeah. So what do you think? I don't think so, actually, <laughs> because it's hard to be impartial. You don't think you can be impartial? I don't know, because uh, since the, um, the situation is that hard and difficult, maybe it's some, something inside the human nature that's... Uh, <laughs> but why can't you be impartial? No, no not I. No, no, I mean, you, why don't you think people can be impartial? Because what I would argue with you is that I think the reason... Yeah, I mean, I don't want to have all the conversation, but I mean, what I would say, what changed my life, I, and I think I can be pretty impartial, is travelling. 
and meeting people in other countries because until I travelled I had propaganda from my country mm -hmm. and every country has its propaganda but that propaganda is to tell you how to think um, and when you travel you know that some of that propaganda is wrong so it's much easier to be impartial if you actually experience different countries, different cultures. So I think people are partial until they have the experience. The Sorry? The yeah, abs and the more you meet other people yeah. from other countries, yes. The more you communicate. <laughs> okay, yeah, please. Uh, I have two questions. Yeah. Uh, the first one, uh, as I told you before, I am from Honduras, and we have a lot of native people. Yes. And we try to go to the communities and like we make them involved in our in the research. is very difficult because most of them do not even know our own native language, that is Spanish. So they have their own ethnic uh, yes. language. So I want to ask if you have this experience before and what did you did for accomplishing And the second question. It's about politics. Uh, most of the cases when we uh, talk about climate change and about activities that involve climate change, businessmen and politi uh, political uh, politics uh, are involved because they have business that are involved with industry. So how can we talk about the bad issues uh, that are related to the climate change? OK. Um. The first one, it, it is extremely difficult, um, but I had the, the privilege of working with many indigenous peoples uh, in different countries. Um, and the, the starting point is to understand that uh, they have a different knowledge base, um, but that knowledge base can be equally valuable to our Western science knowledge base. Uh, and the two together, increase our understanding of the system. The problem is that the indigenous, what we call traditional ecological knowledge, has no measure of uncertainty. Remember I use these two words, uncertainty and variability. There's no measure of uncertainty. So you can talk to one person and you can be um, extremely sure that what they're telling you is correct. But then they can talk to you about something else and it can be totally incorrect and you don't believe it. And you don't know where the certainty is in the middle. Scientists have measures of uncertainty. Um, so we can, we, we can grade our uncertainty. But with indigenous knowledge, it's very difficult in the middle. But the, mo the most important thing is to make the contact and try to find common ground. I don't know how you overcome the language problem. But very often, you're starting from a point where they feel inferior. They, they, f they feel that uh, they're being suppressed. And they feel that their culture is in danger and that they have nothing to offer and they feel threatened. And, and that's most indigenous people feel that way. It's changed in many of the Arctic peoples and now they're in a position of power. Uh, so it, and in some cases it's gone too far. So for example, if you go to Nunavut, which is now run by a government of uh, Inuit, um, you need permission to do your research there from them. So you can't just fly there, take some samples of plants. You need their permission. And that seems rather silly to me, because if I'm looking at remote sensed images in my laboratory in England, I don't really feel that I need permission to ask someone in Canada to, uh, for, to do that. But, but they want to know what's going on. They want control of what's going on. So I think things have gone, the balance has shifted a little bit instead of coming at the, uh, where, it, where the balance is. Um, but I think from what you're describing, you've got a long, long wait before you get to that stage. I think in Greenland, I was very privileged because I saw two processes. When I first went there, the Greenlanders uh, felt very inferior. They were um, influenced by American culture, They're drinking Coca-Cola, uh, listening to American pop music, and even watching Vietnam War films uh, in the early 70s. And they were almost ashamed of being Greenlandic. And then in the 80s, 90s, they started being taught about their own skills at school. So the boys would be taught how to build kayaks, the old hunting boats, and the girls would be taught handicrafts, as well as modern things, of course. But then they started to get their pride back, and they started to say, oh, yes, we, we, we are a nice group. We, we're an important group, and we have our culture. And now they're a very proud people. 
and now they, they are working with the, uh, the government of Denmark to secure the future of Greenland. So there's a long process. That process has taken 40, 50 years, but there is a long process to go to. But you should start, and start by, um, by making them f feel valued and making their understanding feel valued as well. Is anyone here very religious? <laughs> Does anyone have a, a very strong religious faith? No? Yes? Okay, I just don't want to offend anyone, but I want to give you a, a, a story of, of the indigenous people. I'm sorry, are we okay for time, Irena? Okay. Are we okay? Okay, so when I was started my PhD, I went to Greenland, and that was 1967. Um, and when I was in Greenland, I, I was very interested in the culture. So I tried to learn everything I could about the local people and talk to them. And they produced a lot of uh, carvings of, um, from whale teeth and walrus tusk from ivory. And these carvings were very beautiful carvings of everyday life, and some of them were of spirits. Um, the old traditional mythological spirits that they still believed in. And I collected some of these and I heard the stories about what these spirits were, where they were from and what they did because some of them were used to harm people. And then in 1947, sorry, 19, in 2007, I went back again to exactly the same place and I wanted to find out whether the same, hunt, the same carvers were there and they weren't. Um, they died, of course. But the first thing that had changed, and this is something that impressed me very greatly, the first thing was I found a carver, a young man, and he was carving not ivory, but reindeer antler. He wasn't allowed to carve the teeth of the whales they caught, or the walrus they ate, because of what was happening to elephants in Africa. And that, that is globalization. And that, for me, was really weird, that because of a problem in Africa, his way of life changed in Greenland. Um, because there's, there's no threat of extinction of walruses or, or whales. But anyway, that was one thing. But then I got talking to this guy, and he, he asked me why I was there. And I said, I want to see my own research sites. I want to see if the vegetation has changed. I want to see if the environment's changed. And then he started talking to me about all the changes he'd seen. And everything was absolutely perfect. He, his, he was an extremely good environmental observer, really good. And then I wanted to know about the stories I'd been told almost 50 years before. So I said I'd heard stories of uh, the spirits. That, uh, they're called Tupilak. And I heard stories of these, but I wasn't sure whether they were correct or whether I'd remember them. I was testing him. I didn't want to tell him my story, I wanted him to tell me his to see if it was the same or that had changed. And he told me the story of the Tupilax, and it's exactly the same as I'd heard almost 50 years before. So nothing had changed. So, but then when he was telling me the Tupilax, he blew my mind away, he took out a mobile phone, it was an iPhone, and he said, it's funny you should ask me about that because my friend in the next village has just seen one. He's just seen a shape-shifting Tupilac who was a man who walked to the end of the, to the, the beach and then he changed into a bird and he flew away onto a rock and then he changed into a seal and then swam into the water and, and swam away. He said, I'm expecting him to send me a video clip now. So if you just stay with me for a few minutes, you will see a video clip. Right. So the first thing that happened to me is that I, my mind was destroyed because here's a man who's given me 100% certainty about the environment, but 100% uncertainty about the mythology. And now this is a, why I asked you about religion, because I thought this was weird and this was something special to the indigenous people. But then when I came home, I started thinking, and my friend, who's cleverer than I am, said to me, but Terry, half of Western civilization believe in religion. And they believe in the metaphysics. It's a different metaphysics, but it's not a, 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 not a subject that can be um, measured in scientific ways. And it happens with us too. We're sending people to the moon, but some of the people that develop that methodology are, are very religious people, believing in the, in the metaphysics. So it's just the reason why I'm telling this story is to tell you that we may laugh at the indigenous peoples if we don't think. You know, the, the story of someone shifting shape, 
we might laugh at and say that person is just stupid but then would you go to a church and tell the people in that church that they're stupid modern people in western civilization you wouldn't do it so you see the, the problem we have we have to treat them as equals we, we cannot just treat them as, as, as stupid so I hope that, that was a long explanation but I hope it gave you some some help but now there is a big yeah, I, I could go on forever about this. But what, what I, I uh, wrote a paper with an anthropologist and we did something very, sim uh, very simple. We, we set up um, a table and the table was if you have an indigenous person and a scientist and they're observing things, what happens if they both observe the same thing and they agree with their observations? Well, the end point of that is you have even greater certainty, okay? What happens if the scientist and the indigenous person disagree with what they think about the process? Well, that's the next area for the scientists to explore, to find out why they disagree. What happens if the, science, if the indigenous person knows something that the scientist doesn't know? Well, again, the, the scientists should be looking at that because the scientists don't know everything. So they should be looking at that. And the last one, which is about the whole of this talk, is what happens if the scientist knows something and the indigenous person doesn't know? And that means the scientist's communication is useless. <laughs> mm -hmm. So that's what the whole of this talk has been about, communication. So we have to communicate to the indigenous peoples as well as listening to them. No, so that's why there is a, an Arctic Council. Sorry? No, I mean, that's why there is an, Ar an Arctic Council. I mean, I mean, just where all, all types of, uh, I mean, all kinds of initial, initial people, um, like from Canada, from USA, yeah. they come in, and also the government of countries, Scandinavian countries, from all countries. Yes. Yeah, the Arctic Council is good in getting all those people together. Yeah, yeah. And the indigenous peoples have a, a, a big part, they have a big impact on the Arctic Council. So they also have some header of their like, community. And yeah, it's a you represent uh, their ideas. Yeah, yeah. And they're called the permanent participants to the Arctic Council. And they have their head office in Copenhagen. Yeah? Yeah, it's good. I'm sorry, I have just one uh, small comment uh, about uh, travel. Uh, back to this uh, question. Uh, so my idea is uh, the more you travel, the more you understand not only as the countries, as the people and as the cultures, you more understand your own country. Yes. Because <laughs> if you're not traveling, you never know what is your own country. Yes. You Absolutely. Have opportunities to compare. Yeah. So that is Absolutely. So and, and that is, the, and I completely agree, I completely agree, yeah. Are there any other questions or comments? You're exhausted. Sorry? So we have to speak about all these issues with young people, studying the schools and then... Yes, them. yes. I can't say that our, our teachers speak so much about all these things. No. So no questions. But whether it is language classes, whether other classes... Olga has a big list of paper of all the things she should have done today <laughs> before going on holiday. And one of them at the bottom is to make a memorandum of understanding with Polar Educators International. And th this is a group, an international group, that is um, providing educational resources for young children, school children, and they have no representative in Russia. So th I, I gave a presentation to them in Cambridge and they, I said, told them about TSU and uh, they said they would be really happy to make contact with TSU and then maybe you can translate some of their materials into uh, Russian but also give some of your materials to them and the animations that are being produced here, they will be available to them. Okay, so maybe you can do some homework. <laughs>
<laughs> it's a pleasure.